Sea of Stars, is this the RPG gem, a beacon in the vast ocean of gaming, or does it get lost in the sea of competition? And when it comes to Super Mario Bros. Wonder, does it deliver the 2D experience that diehard fans have been craving since the days of Super Mario World? All of this and more with Play and Tell. So welcome back guys to another episode of Play and Tell. I'm Xander Scullion and this is a series where I talk about games I've been playing, leave little short impressions, many reviews, and most importantly when you walk away, you have something new to play. So a couple of videos back I was talking about the decline of physical media. Yes, yeah, inevitable and my journey to try to find a physical copy of Mortal Kombat 1 on the PlayStation 5 and big shout out to my co-host of XS Gaming Podcast James Gruesome. He ended up sending me a copy on the PlayStation 5. And we actually did a little anniversary episode, uh, catching up with all of our listeners. And I'll have a link in the description below to that show. It was a lot of fun. But yes, I got Mortal Kombat 1. And honestly, you know, as much as people detest the, the concept of reboots, I can understand it. I feel like Mortal Kombat is a series that benefits, you know, every couple of years of just having a little reboot. We saw it with Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance and had its own trilogy ending with Armageddon. And we saw it with the Xbox 360 and PS3's Mortal Kombat 9 ending with Mortal Kombat 11. And despite Mortal Kombat 1 being a direct sequel to the events of Mortal Kombat 11, this is a straight up reboot, a brand new timeline. The events of Mortal Kombat 11 led Luke Kane to be the controller of time and he made his own universe. And for the most part, it's pretty great. I mean, there, he's the protector of Earthrealm, he's the fire god. There's weird things like Kulao and Raiden being brothers. Shang Tsung is just a street performer selling, you know, placebo herbal medicine. But there are some nefarious things that start happening that start to collide the multiverse of Mortal Kombat. I never thought I would say something like that, but here we are. Now, one of the things I feel like Mortal Kombat 1 and Street Fighter 6 have in common is they kind of tailor to the single player experience. And Someone like myself who grew up playing fighting games, I have to admit, I'm not as good as I used to be. So when I see fighting games with good first player, single player experiences, uh, sign me up. You have your story mode, which, you know, I've already explained a little bit of what's going on. And it's a lot of fun. It's not a long campaign. You can beat it at probably around like two to three hours. But it, it does a great job of helping you figure out who your favorite character is because you're playing as the different characters in the game, learning the ins and outs of the mechanics, and also having a really interesting story that honestly felt like I was watching an old school 80s uh, action movie. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. But other than story mode, you also have unlockables with the crypt. You also have um, the invasion mode, which is honestly kind of like Mortal Kombat meets Mario Party because your character is on this hub screen that looks almost like a board game and each piece you go to has a different kind of like objective so every fight's a little different and of course you have classic arcade mode as well the the tower of power mode and uh, at the very end you get a little a little ending for each character which adds some replayability and some unlockables but how is the gameplay honestly I don't count Mortal Kombat 11 because I play that on the Switch. I did play Mortal Kombat X on the PS4 and I wasn't really that impressed. I felt like those Mortal Kombat games were kind of slow. I felt like all the characters had like cement feet. I just felt like it was really sluggish. Or Mortal Kombat 1 feels a lot more balanced. It feels a lot more snappy. I felt like, you know, performing combos had weight to it, but at the same time, you had great movability with each character. And little added bonuses like your cameo characters, it, it kind of gives it a little bit more uh, strategic approach because you can you know, call on these characters to help you with a special move or an x-ray move. Yes, x-ray moves are, are here as well. So, you know, if you're going down on your luck or maybe you want to add an extra, you know, kick to the face, you can do the x-ray move and... Yeah, it's it's pretty gory. So yeah, Mortal Kombat 1, it's definitely a really fun game. I don't know if I'll be getting all the DLC that's coming out for it, but for, for the most part, I was really enjoying it. Finish him. And another game I've been playing is Sea of Stars. I've been playing it on PlayStation Plus. You can also play it on Game Pass, 
Um, you know, this was a game that I knew was uh, related to The Messenger, which was a really fun, like, ninja side-scrolling platformer for Sabotage games. The gradual unfolding of Sea of Stars' narrative is primarily what defines the experience. The story does kick off at a rather safe pace, casting you in the roles of two chosen heroes, honing their magical abilities in preparation to confront an impending doom. During the initial half of the game, you'll encounter somewhat standard narrative developments that you would see through other RPGs, and unfortunately, some of these conversations tend to extend their prolonged durations, resulting in a significant amount of time dedicated to rapidly advancing through the text. There were a couple times I even contemplated if I wanted to finish Sea of Stars, but I just kept at it, and honestly, the story does get better as you progress through it. But I really enjoyed the gameplay. The Sea of Stars. The battles consistently delivered an enjoyable experience thanks to the well-crafted combat system which strikingly resembles a fusion of elements between Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG. Each turn you had the option to choose from an array of actions, including standard attacks, skills, and combos reminiscent of tech abilities in Chrono Trigger, and item usage. Precise time button presses during an attack can yield increased damage adding an extra layer of satisfaction, especially with attacks that result in multi-hit extravaganzas. Well-timed button presses also enhance the healing effectiveness. Given the games providing a countdown clock to indicate when enemies are about to strike, you can strategically decide which foes to target to do the most damage. The standout combat feature is the lock system, and occasionally, when an enemy prepares for an attack, icons represent various attack types appear alongside their turn timer which if you manage to hit the enemy with the right attacks before the timer reaches zero, you can execute a devastation move. This is going to be an RPG like Octopath Traveler and some of the you know more recent RPGs that years from later, like role-playing enthusiast channels on YouTube are going to be like, man, you remember back in the day when Sea of Stars came out? It's got that kind of hype to it. And what I like most about Sea of Stars, it's not a long game. You can beat it in around like 30 hours. That's... That's not a really long RPG by the day's standards and kind of realistic for someone like me who does more than just play video games all day. You know, working a full-time job, it was rewarding to come home and boot up my PlayStation 5 and play Sea of Stars because it was, it made me go back back in time, you know. I was playing it and I was like, man, this makes you think of like a, a PS1 RPG I would rent during the summer and, and play um, with my friends on the weekend. Uh, it's, it's a great game. I cannot recommend it enough. Now, the next game I want to talk about is a retro game for the Sega Dreamcast that just recently got an English patch and that is Rena Hero Number 1. This is a very interesting, quirky game that honestly I feel like is the missing link between Yakuza and Shinmu. Uh, this is actually a remake of Rena Hero that was also only released in Japan back in 1991 by Sega's AM2 team. In the story, you're playing as this, this kid who just moved into a new town. His dad's got a new job. They're having a dinner party, just trying to rub elbows with all the, the new neighbors and everything. And Food's getting a little scarce. Your mom's slaving away in the kitchen. Your dad's like, hey, hey, go uh, go order some pizzas. So you go to order some pizzas and you end up winning a contest. The dude shows up to your door with a big box that's a superhero costume and a home console that looks very familiar called the, the Sega Creamcast. That, that's the thing. This game is constantly breaking the fourth wall and just adding this really funny dialogue that I'm so glad it's got an English patch because I feel like a lot of this really would be lost in translation. So, so yeah, your dad comes downstairs, dresses Godzilla, and now you're in the superhero suit. That's the first fight of the whole game is fighting your dad, your drunk dad, in this moldy Godzilla suit. But now since you're a, a Rena hero, you have objectives. You log on to your Creamcast, you have uh, various different missions to go through the game, and they start off very, you know, innocent, like passing out flyers or, you know, helping a damsel in distress. But the more you progress through the missions, the harder they get and the more elaborate they get as well. You go from, you know, passing out pizza flyers to trying to stop an evil Yakuza scheme in town. And you do have a time limit of how long you can be in the superhero suit. That's kind of where the strategy goes in because 
there were times that I would walk around not as a superhero, get into a random battle and just get the snot beat out of me. So you don't want to stay in your superhero suit too long because the, the battery will drain and you have to pay money to rent another suit. It gets really confusing, but you also don't want to die either because you end up waking up in the hospital with half your money gone. While the game definitely shows its age with tank-like controls and you know things like autosave not being there, I cannot recommend this game enough. And I would say if you're playing this on the emulator, the emulator of choice I would recommend is Flycast. Listen, I love Redream and I know some folks are going to comment saying how great Redream is. It's my go-to. But for some reason, this English patch ROM isn't really compatible with it. Um, I did get some texture issues and straight up game freezes. And with this game not having an autosave, if the game freezes and you have to start back from your last save, that can be very problematic. So definitely play this on original hardware. Rather, you burn it on a CD or if you have your um, you know, Dreamcast modded with the SD card extension, do that. Or if you're using an emulator, use Flycast all the way. Now back in June, during the Nintendo Direct, Nintendo announced a brand new 2D Mario with Super Mario Brothers Wonder. And I have to admit, I, I wasn't really that excited. I mean, I was like, oh, I'm definitely gonna check it out. I love Mario, I love 2D Mario. But I have to admit, the new Super Mario Brothers line kind of left a sour taste in my mouth because I felt like those games were so safe. I, I felt like the controls were kind of floaty, and it felt almost like buying a Greatest Hits album to a band that just broke up, that got back together, that released like two or three new songs on the Greatest Hits album. So you end up buying the Greatest Hits album just to hear those three new songs, and it's okay. It's all right. Where Super Mario Brothers Wonder does feel like Super Mario Brothers 5. I feel like this is a, a follow-up to Super Mario World. The controls are so snappy. The, the, the story... The story, I mean, Bowser straight up turns into a castle. You, Bowser invades the Flower Kingdom while Mario and his party are having a good time. And yeah, he turns into the castle. You have to help the prince, which is this happy little caterpillar guy, collect the various royal seeds and unlock the shackles and defeat Bowser. The story, listen, the story is not what makes this a game of the year contender. It's the gameplay. You have a wide prefla of characters to choose from from mario to luigi to peach toad toadette daisy and of course you have yoshi and nappet which yoshi and nappet play very differently from the other characters uh because they don't get damaged by enemies they only die through uh pitfalls which is a great idea in case you're playing multiplayer with someone that's not as experienced you don't have to constantly babysit them while you're trying to play this uh, game. One of the things I don't like about modern platformers, I have to admit, is I don't like the collect the thon mechanic. I don't like the fact that I have to collect the little trickets and tokens in order to progress through the game. I just want to go from point A to point B. Sometimes you hit those roadblocks and you see that with Super Mario Wonder, but what makes it different is the fact that the Wonder Seed adds a whole new game mechanic. If anything, I would go back to stages just to find this seed because I wanted to see what new experience I could have. Because every seed, every stage has a different thing that doesn't repeat itself. And it could be anything from, you know, the, the sky turning into water and jumping through it or Mario turning into a piece of cake. In a weird way, it works. And all pastries aside, of course, you do have some various different power-ups. You have your old and faithful fire power. You also have a bubble power-up, which is very similar to Super Mario uh, Land. And also um, a drill hat where you can go up and down the ground, which is kind of cool. And of course, the elephant, the wow, the wowie zowie. I have to admit, when I when I saw Mario turn into an elephant, I was like, okay, all right, that's that's cool, I guess. But I do like the fact that it's tastefully done. It's not like a, a shoehorn gimmick that's you know being like, hey, you need to be an elephant throughout the whole game. And it's it's fun. It's Mario, but he's an elephant. He can swing his trunk around. He can fill up his trunk with water if he sees it coming out of pipes. I mean, that that's pretty much it. You, you also have badges that you collect throughout the game. So, you know, your wall jumps and uh, some things like not dying when you hit a pitfall. Just various different elements of badges that you can unlock and wear in the game that re really customizes your experience and, in my opinion, can add some replayability. If you're a completionist, this is going to be the game for you because it's not that long of a game, but it also has so many secrets. And unlike New Super Mario Brothers, 
Super Mario Wonder is a game that I could see myself going back to, like Super Mario Bros. 3 or Super Mario World. I play those games at least once a year all the way through, and I feel the same way with Super Mario Bros. Wonder. You know, I sound like a broken record when I say that 2023 is a blockbuster year for games, and this is just another one of many contenders for my game of the year. But anyway, guys, what have you been playing? Leave a comment below. I'd love to hear some of your gaming recommendations, and if you've been playing some of these games, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and opinions. Now, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, but also hit the bell so you're notified on all future videos that come out on this channel. Anyway, guys, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And as always, happy gaming.